Can you believe that we've made over 100 countdowns based on the Legend of Zelda series and never once made a list about the items? Well, it's about freaking time we did, so that's what we're gonna do now. This series has seen a huge variety of items in all the different games. There are a great deal of items that exist in the real world, but this series has also introduced us to a lot of unique items that doesn't exist outside of this very franchise. When we rank these items, we want to take a look at how useful they are. Do they have more than one purpose? Like, can you only solve puzzles with them? Or can you only use them against enemies? Or maybe you can do both? Can they be used for transportation? Are they important to the game or story in any way? Are they used quite often? And of course, are they fun to use? Since there are items that have made their mark and appear in several, if not almost all the Zelda games that have been made, it's easy to leave out those more unique ones that hasn't appeared as often. So we have decided to make two different lists about items. This one will be about the reoccurring items, meaning the items that have appeared multiple times. We have decided to make this list eligible for items that has appeared in at least three games in the main series. Also, some items have had many variations throughout the series. For example, there are many different strength enhancements, like different gloves and bracelets. They are all somewhat different, and they have different strengths, but they basically all do the same thing. That's why we would want to count them all as one if you had this type of item on the list. Now that you know this, you should expect to see entries like these in this video. So, with the rules of the list and our idea of splitting the items into two different lists explained, we're the owners of Triforce, I'm owner 1. And I'm owner 2, and we're finally opening our minds about the items. First with our top 10 reoccurring items in the Legend of Zelda series. The first item to show itself on this list is one, or actually sort of two, that only appear in a few 2D games. Making its first appearance in Link's Awakening is the Rock's Feather, essentially made to make Link jump. In two of the three games prior to Link's Awakening, Link wasn't able to jump at all, except off ledges in A Link to the Past. Thanks to the Rock's Feather, Link could almost jump as freely as he could in Adventure of Link. It's basically all it does. It lets you jump across gaps, holes, but there are also a few puzzles in Oracle of Ages that require the ability to jump. But it's also useful together with other items, like the Pegasus Boots or Swift Seeds that creates a combo that allows you to jump over wider gaps. Oracle of Seasons introduced an upgrade to Rock's Feather, known as Rock's Cape, that allowed you to glide a bit further, much of the same as the combo of Speed Enhancement and the Feather alone. The Cape would also appear again in Four Swords and Minish Cap but as a separate item and not an upgrade. In Minish Cap, you also get to learn a down thrust attack from Swift Blade, which makes you jump into the air and thrust down on enemies below you. It's mostly used for transportation like jumping across holes and such, both small and larger ones, but it's also used for a few certain puzzles for at least one game. The cape also adds another dimension to the battling with the use of down thrust. Plus, they're both pretty fun to use, so we decided to put them both at number 10. Equipment like boots, shields and tunics are also eligible for this list, but since boots and tunics only let the traits take effect just by wearing them, there's not much fun in using them. Sure, a lot of the tunics are great looking, and I really love the red one. But shields are a bit more useful, because you can actually use them actively in combat to block attacks and even do a few strikes with them. However, we didn't want to put pure weapons like swords or shields onto the list either. But there is one specific shield in the series that does other things than just defend you from enemies. The Mirror Shield, of course. It has appeared in a good number of the games since I linked to the past, but they're definitely most useful in the 3D games. They have their defensive effect in the 2D games, and it's sort of used actively in Link's Awakening as well, but it's so much more fun to use in the third dimension. Appearing for the first time in a 3D game in the Spirit Temple in Ocarina of Time, the mirror on the shield is used to reflect beams from light onto switches and other things that trigger things like doors opening, chests to appear, or something that just fakes you out. What's great here is that you actually control the direction you want the beam to hit. It's pretty much all the same in the other games too, as you use the mirror shield in Arcana Castle and Stone Tower Temple in Majora's Mask, 
and the Earth Temple in Wind Waker, to name a few. It also looks very cool, with the coolest one being from Ocarina of Time, but Majora's Mask really took a more dramatic and somewhat creepy approach with it. The shield is so much fun to use against Twin Rova in the Spirit Temple, and the shield only gets cooler when you get to absorb the elemental power of the boss, making it a really cool looking item, and also a very useful one when it comes to puzzles besides combat. One of the items appearing in the very first Zelda game, and that has kept coming back over and over again, is the Boomerang, which lands on our 8th place. The Boomerang is something that hasn't changed all that much through the series. It's very useful in how it can stun enemies and grab items from a distance, in addition to trigger switches and other things to help solve puzzles. It can kill a few weak enemies in most games, but there is one game that has an absolutely overpowered Boomerang, and that's Link's Awakening. It's actually an optional item you can get through the trading sequence, and it's able to cut through bushes, defeat anti-fairies, sparks, and guineas, and it's also super effective against the final boss of Nightmare itself. In Wind Waker you're able to select up to 5 targets in one throw, which is a really cool use of it. The use in Phantom Hourglass was really cool as well, as you can draw a path for the stylus that it will take, and you can draw it in any way you want. Plus. It can be used to carry the fire from one torch to another. Then there's also the Gale Boomerang from Twilight Princess. Like the one from Wind Waker, it can also be used to select up to 5 targets for one throw, but it even has the addition of a tornado surrounding it. This allows it to put out flames, pick up enemies and send them elsewhere, pick up bombs on the way and make it explode against boulders, among other things. The Boomerang is a really simple item. In some games it can be strong against enemies, but it's usually meant for stunning them. And it's mostly useful for puzzle solving and gathering rupees and other stuff that you're too lazy to walk up to and pick up yourself. Another real world item that has appeared in several games in the series is the hammer, and it also has a few variations. Making its first appearance in Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, it's used to break boulders standing in your way, or even cut down trees, which is a bit odd in itself, but you don't even see the animation of it. But reappearing as the magic hammer in the Palace of Darkness in A Link to the Past, it could now be used for more things. First of all, it was now useful in combat, especially with Helmasaurs and these damn terror pins. It could also break things like pots and skulls, in addition to a combo with the ice rod that would freeze enemies and the hammer could break them into pieces. It has a short reach, so it's not always a safe weapon to use against enemies under normal circumstances. Ocarina of Time introduced the Megaton Hammer, which was necessary to send down pillars in the Fire Temple and press certain switches in addition to being helpful in breaking certain rocks. Wind Waker had the Skull Hammer, a very large item with a very long reach that could smash a lot of enemies and is definitely the most useful one in combat among its 3D appearances. So the hammer can be used in combat and for certain puzzles, in addition to other conveniences like destroying boulders blocking your path. Some hammers in later games don't do much more than to perhaps increase the effect of a shockwave or damage done to enemies. But Phantom Hourglass has a very interesting use with it. Since the stylus is important in this game, you can press anywhere on the touchscreen to use the hammer, meaning that you can actually use it with greater distances. The hammer isn't in Link's hands, but rather, literally, in your own hands. Well, Seal is really the one carrying the hammer in the game, but you're still the one in control. The hammer has become a very common item in the series, and it hasn't always evolved in great fashion, but it has some slight and useful differences, and in general, it's a very fun item to use in just about every game it appears in. Ah, the lantern. It's so useful, you can use it to light torches, and in some games, hurt enemies, and even melt ice. Yeah, but if you want real firepower, you can use the fire rod. It can also light torches, actually, multiple at once. And it's much easier to use in order to melt ice or hurt enemies, especially when it comes to distances. Yeah, I guess you're right. The fire rod is much more effective. But the lantern also creates real atmosphere. Take Twilight Princess for instance. 
It's so cool how the lantern just light up around you, making the exploration of caves so much more exciting to me. It even has that very cool effect in Minish Cap as well. Yeah, I guess you're right too. Ah heck, let's put them both here. They have a lot of the same abilities, but the fire rod just works a lot better to higher effect. It has made appearances in A Link to the Past, Four Swords Adventures, and A Link Between Worlds. In addition to being a magic rod in the first Zelda and Link's Awakening, where they have a similar effect with fire. While the lantern has appeared in a few of the same games, in addition to Twilight Princess and Minish Cap, where they really have an atmospherical advantage. Normally, they're just for lighting stuff at close range, but like I said earlier, they can now be carried and let you see better in a longer radius. It's also really cool how you can leave it hanging on to you while using other items and weapons in Twilight Princess, and in Minish Cap, it's really powerful when it comes to melting ice blocks. As On One has already said, using the lantern is a lot of fun, and especially for him, but it's definitely fun to use the fire rod as well. Shooting a beam of fire in high speed is awesome as you see it lighting multiple torches at once or burning down enemies. They're both especially satisfying to use against Gibdos in games that allow you to. They're both really helpful for certain puzzles and can both really help you with enemies in some specific games. In the original Legend of Zelda game, you could buy potions from the old woman and drink at any time to fill up your health. That was really useful. And there were fairies that would heal you a great deal. They didn't occur all the time, but when they first did, you had to grab it right there and then. If you wanted to carry something to heal you at any time you wanted yourself, you had to bring a aforementioned potion. A real lifesaver was then introduced in A Link to the Past. There were still potions to be bought from a witch. But this game introduced a super useful item to the series, the bottle. From this point on, along with the bug net, you could capture these fairies to save them for another time, either to use any time you wanted, or for them to save your life at the moment you fall. No longer did you have to visit someone to buy potions, as if you were lucky enough to find a fairy after killing an enemy or finding one in a pot or something, you could now just capture it in the bottle and put it in your pocket for later. However, this is far from the bottle's only use. It can carry so many things than just fairies and potions. Throughout the series, it has been able to carry water in case you need it for something special, both normal water and hot water. You can carry a fish in it, which you need in order to enter Jabba Jabba's belly in Ocarina of Time. It can also house a bug, which is useful in N64 games with the soft soils for instance. You can always fill it with another health saving liquid, milk. How about some blue fire that can melt a certain type of ice? Zora eggs, chew jelly, gold dust, oil for your lantern, soup. It can carry so many different things. Hell, the strangest and perhaps the funnest thing it can carry is the freaking Deku Princess in Majora's Mask. Seriously, the bottle is super useful for so many things. Whether it's about items that can regain your health, solve puzzles, restock on your oil, or help out with important quests, the bottle has become a very important item in the series, and it never hurts to collect all of them as soon as you can. An item that certainly isn't made up in the Zelda series is the bomb. It has actually appeared in every Zelda game except for Zelda 2, which didn't have that many items really. Bombs aren't usually all that special, since they always have one purpose, to blow things up. That's basically it. However, the Zelda series has come up with some very creative ways in how to do it. What makes bombs in this series special is that they have come in many different varieties, both original and inspired or taken from elsewhere. It started out simple in the original game where you just place them on the ground and they'd explode after a second or two. In A Link to the Past, they did the same thing, but you can also pick them up to throw them in any direction you want. There was also this super bomb you need in the end of the game, which you had to lead from the shop to the pyramid to find a pretty large fairy that would upgrade some important items. Ocarina of Time introduced bomb flowers that grew in very convenient places, but more interestingly was the bomb chew that could travel a distance along the ground, but also up walls and on the ceiling to reach different targets. Majora's Mask had a mask that could explode while hurting you, unless you use your shield at the same time. There was also the Powder Keg, a very heavy and powerful explosive that was needed to blow up certain obstacles. Wind Waker introduced a cannon for your ship, 
which was very fun to use at sea to either defeat annoying enemies or blow up other ships, or perhaps obstacles as well. There was also this big bomb with four swords adventures, however, they were often just found in chests, and they were more of a hazard than useful. Minish Cap had remote controlled bombs, which is very useful, just blow it up whenever you want. Link's Awakening was first out with the Bomb Arrows, a super useful combo that was never seen again until Twilight Princess. It's super awesome to use and very effective against enemies. In addition to that, Twilight Princess also had water bombs that could be used underwater. Plus, there's the Bombling, which wasn't all that great on its own, but together with the Gale Boomerang, they could be very useful. Skyward Sword didn't have a new type of bombs but you could actually throw a bomb along the ground, like a bowling ball. We thought that was really cool. All in all, the bomb is used to blow things up, which is a simple concept. But it can be used to blow up cracks in the walls, huge obstacles blocking your path, hit switches, and it can be very useful to hurt enemies. And with the variety of creative ways that they used in this series, it's become a very common and useful item that keeps reinventing itself in a small but cool ways, and we feel that it definitely belongs this high on the list. There is a certain type of item that has appeared in almost every game, even ever since the very first Zelda game. But it wasn't until the 4th and 5th game that this certain type of item had any real significance. What is it? Well, look at the title, and you'll know what kind of important item this is. There have been several types of musical instruments in the series, either if it's a recorder, a flute, an ocarina, a harp, or even a baton. Don't forget the trumpets, drums, and the dead fish guitar. Oh, of course, there are those too. As mentioned, the musical instrument didn't have a big variety of uses or even tunes in the beginning of the series. It was used for transportation, defeating one boss, and opening the entrance to a dungeon in the first game. The latter also goes for Zelda 2, in addition to get the river devil out of the way. And in A Link to the Past, it was once again used for transportation. Sure, you learned three melodies in Link's Awakening, and the Ballad of the Windfish played a big role in the story so it's there it started with a bit more variety and importance. But Ocarina of Time sure took it to a whole other level. All of a sudden, you had a specific song that could open or unlock different paths, make it rain, make these time blocks disappear and reappear, call on your horse, talk to a friend, turn night into day and the other way around, in addition to six songs for traveling to six different temples. And to do all this, you actually had to play the melody yourself creating a whole new dimension to the musical instrument. An instrument of this significance was also brought over to Majora's Mask and Wind Waker, where you keep learning new songs for traveling, solving puzzles and a lot of other things. The series never really put it away, with a usable instrument also appearing in Minish Cap, both Oracle games, Skyward Sword and Sword of Twilight Princess with the Howling and A Link Between Worlds with the Bell to Call on Arine. Even if some people think the items like the harp and skyward sword and the spirit flute in spirit tracks were either lame or hard to use, there's no doubt that the musical instruments have been a huge and fun part of Link's arsenal. While it hasn't been all that useful in combat, it's been useful in a huge number of other ways overall, either if it's just for transportation over great distances, puzzle solving, communication, changing the time of day, the direction of the wind, or just making a pissed off Goron leader super happy, the musical instrument is an item we really feel deserves its place on number 3 on this list. And now, the absolute coolest Zelda item that has some originality to it, and you know which one this is, the Hookshot. It has reappeared many times in the series, either if it's by the hookshot, longshot, clawshot or whatever, but it usually has the same functions, but sometimes with other combos. Making its first appearance in the Swamp Palace in A Link to the Past, it showed its real usefulness by extending a hook to reach the chests, pots, schools or blocks for you to cross over gaps. In addition to that, it can grab rupees, hearts and other things like the boomerang but it's also really powerful in combat in A Link to the Past, making this a very useful item to keep at your action button at all times as soon as you get it. 
Its use in the 3D games is not less fun at all, but it stuns most of the enemies rather than killing them like in A Link to the Past, so it's not as useful in combat here, especially when certain enemies can easily block it, and it's no good for picking up hearts and stuff. This is also where you get the long shot, which really is just the same item but with extended reach. The item also appears in Link's Awakening and Majora's Mask, but it's not until Wind Waker that it introduces a new way to use it. You get it inside the Wind Temple, and combining this item with the Iron Boots allows you to gain weight and leverage to pull huge, heavy things down. It's a fun way to use it, but it's not something you do a whole lot. However, in Twilight Princess you get the Claw Shot. We don't totally get why it was changed to a claw instead of a hook, but it's probably because it can then grab hearts and rupees a lot easier. But cooler and more importantly, it's probably because this item now allows you to hold onto a target in the ceiling, allowing you to raise and lower yourself all, like you mentioned before, Mission Impossible style. That's already an awesome new way to use this item, but it all gets much, much cooler and more fun as soon as you get the item of the city in the sky. A second claw shot. With two in your hands, you can grab onto a target on the wall, stay there, and look for a new one. This also makes hanging from the ceiling a lot more fun as well. This combo of two claw shots was also carried over to Skyward Sword, and it was also used in fun ways there. No matter if its use for combat has been weakened over the years, the use of the item in both second and especially third dimension has been amazingly fun. Using it to get around on walls or ceilings, take out enemies, or even just the easy task of hitting a switch, is also very fun, and it's definitely our most beloved when it comes to more original cell items. Our number one item should be obvious at this point. It's not at all an item original to the Legend of Zelda series, but it is one that has been used in almost every single game. This, of course, is the bow and arrow. Appearing in every Zelda game except Zelda 2 and both Oracle games, the bow is probably the one item most people think of when it comes to the Legend of Zelda series, looking away from a sword and a shield, of course. The bow is useful in so many ways. Obviously, it's very useful to hit switches, much like the hookshot and boomerang to name a few other items. It does so in high speed, and it's very useful in other ways when it comes to puzzles, but we'll get back to that in a second. Cause we have to mention just how much better this item usually is than both the boomerang and hookshot, particularly for one thing, combat. As much as this item can be used for puzzles, it's mainly a strong weapon. It's very helpful in defeating enemies. Sure, it can be blocked by certain enemies, and it doesn't kill everyone instantly, but it sure deals out a lot of damage. It's been very important in the series when it comes to defeating the true evil, like with the silver arrows you get both in the original Legend of Zelda and A Link to the Past. However, Ocarina of Time brought in new elements to it, which has taken over as the standard when it comes to defeating evil. You have fire and ice arrows for one thing, but the light arrow sort of took over as the one item to banish evil. It's a strong kind of attack which is very apparent in Wind Waker, as pretty much nothing can stand up against it. But when it comes to usefulness in puzzles, the fire and ice arrows are used a lot more. Fire arrows is another item like the lantern and fire rod that can both light torches and melt ice, while the ice arrows can freeze your enemies to stun them as well. Certain switches, like in the N64 games, require the fire arrows or even shooting an arrow through a lit torch to melt the ice around the actual switch. In Majora's Mask, the ice arrows even allowed you to create platforms of ice on the surface of water. As we mentioned about the bombs, there's also the combo of bomb arrows used in Link's Awakening and Twilight Princess, which can outright destroy enemies and block paths from a distance. In addition to this, Twilight Princess also introduced the Hawkeye, that allowed you to use it as a sniper bow, which is also totally fun. No matter if the item is used in a 2D overhead perspective or a 3D first person perspective, the bow has always been used in fun and amazing ways. It's always a helpful item to overcome monsters and bosses, and it's super helpful with puzzles as well, especially when you get the other elemental power-ups. And it's an item and a weapon that will definitely continue to stay with the series for a long time to come.
Hope you enjoyed listening to us finally talk about the items in the series. Did you find the list good, or did we miss anything? Remember to leave it in the comments, along with your favorite reoccurring items as well. Now that it's October, and we're closing in on Halloween, we want to make the two next lists a bit Halloween themed, with the next list being the top 10 unsettling themes. Go ahead and subscribe, thanks for watching, and we hope to see you then.